yeah, I, I, I uh, he's a famous book, I heard. Made all these economies. <laughs> <laughs> Zach Carter, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, Zach, so, you know, your common face on rising, Crystal and I love your analysis. I wanted to make sure you could come and join the realignment to talk about your book, The Price of Peace. It's a book that I've really been into. Marshall and I have been talking about it a lot. It's a biography. I mean, it's a living history kind of of John Maynard Keynes, which is what I think it's so cool about the book. And that's just something that I wanted to make you come on here, expand on both his life in the context of of the moment, which I think is so, so important. So one of the things that you said there was that Kane spent nearly half a century thinking about how to respond to moments exactly like this one. That's something you said recently. What, what do you mean by that? What, why is this moment we're living in right now uniquely tailored to the Keynesian? I think if you think about Keynes the way that certainly I learned about him in Econ 101, the way I think most people learn about him in Econ 101, this crisis looks rather unusual, you know, um, it, it's not the typical recession in which, uh, you know, you would want to boost, you want the government to boost spending, run up a big deficit in order to sort of get the economy back on track. Um, this is a this is a, a recession in which, in a lot of ways, we want the economy to be not functioning at full steam because it's dangerous, because people will spread a deadly plague between each other. Um, that that understanding of Keynes is, is extremely widespread. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's in his writings. It's a part of, of his writings, this stuff about debt and deficits. But he's really more a philosopher of crisis, I think. And I think when you understand his background, at the, you know, growing up in the turn of the 20th century during the Gilded Age, um, and his total emotional uh, breakdown, really, over World War I, a calamity that he believed to be impossible, uh, to the point of being unthinkable until until it actually arrived and then the great calamity of, of the great depression these are events that keynes was trying to wrap his head around philosophically and then reverse engineering economic solutions and strategies um, to address these crises reshape the world that he lived in and i think we're going through a crisis right now i think we went through a crisis in 2008 which significantly reshaped the world world we live it, lived in and and we came not terribly close to fending off the worst ways uh, in which it could uh, it could be reshaped. This crisis now is is I mean clearly is already reshaping American life. Our politics are scrambled. Uh, we're going to be living with this much much longer than the November election. And I think most people, economists, political thinkers, politicians, um, have are yet to really wrap their heads around the long term. Uh, damage and also opportunity that um, that it poses. So Keynes is a thinker who um, is trying to solve the big problems of his day. He's trying to he's trying to solve war and deprivation. And economics is sort of the tool he decides to use. Um, right. He's not somebody who goes around saying, I have one magic policy trick, and this can be applied to all situations to save the world. So not to diminish the tens of millions of people who died during World War I or all of the terrible deprivation of the Great Depression. Can we really think of the 2008 financial crisis, the 2016 election of Donald Trump, and now this coronavirus crisis is really just a similar sort of analog for what happened back then? I think, I think there, there are a lot of really strong parallels. And I think, you know, looking at the unemployment rate in the United States is not, doesn't fully capture what's happened. Um, if you look at the political breakdown, particularly in Europe, the way the European Union and 50 or 60 years of international uh, of an international political project has, you know, it, there is an institution called the European Union. It still exists. The meaning of that institution is completely different today than it was in 2008. And the way that different countries in that union are negotiating it is completely different. The international scene, the geopolitical order has changed already. It, it's. Mm -hmm. It's, I think we keep talking about globalization like it's going to break or it's about to break. You know, the relationship between the United States and China as it stands today is fundamentally different from what it was in 1998, from what it was in 2008. The order has already changed. We just haven't seen a new order come in to replace the old one. We're living in an era of sort of international fracture, which when you look back on the, the era between the wars, um, 
that's I think I think that's the kind of era that we're looking at now. Hopefully, this doesn't result in a world war the way uh, the way you know it did in Keynes's lifetime. But there was this long period of a decade or so where the world was trying to figure out what to do with itself, and it and Keynes was one of the most important thinkers in trying to shape that order, ultimately failing and and not really having a whole lot of political success until after World War II. This could be jumping around the script a little too much, but I want to actually interrogate whether the order is broken or not, because Joe Biden won the 2020 Democratic primary. And obviously, we have to say Trump could pull off an upset victory like he did in 2016. But it looks like for right now, the neoliberal restoration products going off to a roaring success. So how can we say that the order is broken when it's very plausible that we could have a presidency that could come about that would work in many ways to restore that order. For example, Joe Biden's presidency is going to be much less hostile to international institutions like the WTO or the WHO or the UN. It's going to sign a new version of the Paris Climate Accord. How is the order broken under this context? I think if you look at what has happened during the pandemic, um, the fact that in the United States, we have nurses wearing trash bags to treat people dying and being sent into mobile morgues uh, outside the you know greatest shining city in the country. Um, hundreds of thousands of people dead. The inability to manufacture not only ventilators, you know, which is some, you know fairly complex, you know, sophisticated machinery, but also masks. I mean, mm -hmm. pieces of paper that people put over their face. Um, that to me suggests that. The way that we manufacture and distribute goods, which is at the heart of you know, production, is ultimately at the heart of economics. That that productive uh, engine is is not stable, is not going to last, um, already hasn't lasted. I mean, we we've had to reshuffle the way that we produce things in order to provide basic equipment to doctors for for the pandemic. That that lesson is going to be learned the hard way. As, the, as this crisis results in future types of crises. You know, they are difficult to predict, but the, the breakdown, the, the social economic breakdown caused by coronavirus is not just gonna end with hospital equipment. It's gonna, you know, at some point we're gonna have to start building things again. How are we gonna, how are we gonna repair roads and streets when countries who are also trying to repair roads and streets don't want to have you know, basic, uh, you know, okay. basic construction equipment shipped to the United States. So I also think you know, the standoff between the United States and China, this is something that you eat even Joe Biden, even people in you know the august pages of like the Wall Street Journal talk about as as not not even under strain as as just undergoing a significant change. Um, the way Biden talks about China, the way um, the way Nancy Pelosi talks about China, is much more hawkish, much more aggressive than it was two or three years ago. Um, and I think the types of policies that the Democratic Party is willing to countenance with regard to to trade and manufacturing are are different. They They've stopped looking at China as uh, a benign partner and to some extent uh, as, as, a, as a rising threat to the country. And, you know, there, there are parts of that narrative that make me uncomfortable. I, I think um, I think renegotiating or resetting that relationship is really important. Uh, but I do think that, you know, being excessively hawkish with China is, uh, it, you know, there, there are some serious dangers to the United States and, and the world from that. But I also just don't think we can continue down the path that we've been on. I, I, there was a. This is a little bit self-aggrandizing because it's it was written in a review of uh, of, of my book in the Wall Street Journal. But uh, Ben Steele, who has written some really terrific books about Keynes and globalization himself, you know, said, "Look, the the global order has changed. The re we're not going back to what we had in 2009 or 2010. There's just no way to do it after after the coronavirus." And this is a guy who's you know very you know attached to the global order that we've had since you know, roughly the 19, mid 1970s. He's someone who sees a lot of good in it, a lot of merit in it. Um, and I think he's right. So I think this is a very key insight, both on the global order. Obviously, our podcast is literally called The Realignment. So that's what we want to talk about here. <laughs> you said something very key, something very key to my understanding of economics and where I think you, me, Marshall and others would depart from conventional economics. So I want to piss off that entire profession right now. You said that production is the key to to the economy, right? Production is ultimately what an economy is about. Now, the modern field of economics is much more concerned with top line numbers of GDP, of unemployment, of looking through that, which led to a broader kind of financialization of our economy, of Wall Street, of looking at what does you know economic output uh, through meaningless ultimately kind of economic activity. 
So within that frame, talk about the shift both in our understanding of economics right now and how it plays within to that new world order within the context of you know a geopolitical a geopolitical split and battle with China how has that understanding kind of come about in the field relative to your work that you just produced now and what's some of the pushback that you've gotten and I'll follow up with the specific pushback that you've gotten Dave you've gotten literally the day that we're taping <laughs> yes. yeah. yes. well uh, with uh, yeah just a cover my butt a little bit here with that uh, that pushback. You know, there are all kinds of economists. You know, you can't talk about economics sure, and right. accept every single economist to agree with the characterization that you're doing, uh, that you're making. But um, there's a book that came out a few years ago by um, a, a woman named uh, Jen Harris, who used to be at, uh, at the State Department with um, first under Hillary Clinton, then under John Kerry. And the book's called War by Other Means. And it's essentially a call to revisit the role of free trade policies like those we've seen in NAFTA and, and under the WTO mm -hmm. treaties in American foreign policy. And the argument is essentially that by making those free trade policies an end in themselves, we foreclose all of these other diplomatic options for dealing with allies and adversaries in the international, in the international world. We limit the diplomatic possibilities that are out there. And that ultimately makes war and conflict more likely because when we talk about foreign policy now, we tend to talk about things that involve bombs or, or, uh, or explosives and or troops, what, what have you. The, the, the potential tools available to defuse difficult situations are, are more limited. Um, I think that type of thinking is still not dominant within the Democratic Party. I certainly don't think it's dominant within the Republican Party. But I think the fact that people are talking about this and that these are prominent people, you know, Jen is, uh, I believe she's at the Hewlett Foundation, is a very important foundation in funding liberal, you know, broadly liberal causes. Um, you know, the fact that there are major figures who have, you know, some level of power within, uh, within American ideas, making those those statements and, and publishing those ideas and, and having them being taken seriously does reflect a shift. Um, I think your point about GDP and statistics and the financialization of economics is really, really very important. And I tried to get to this in the book because, you know, Keynes is a complicated guy. And at times he talks about, uh, you know, the coming age of joy through statistics. So he's not right. totally <laughs> immune to uh, <laughs> to the idea that that uh, numbers can save us. But uh, most of his career, uh, he's very skeptical about about turning economics into a math project. And I think to modern ears, that sounds very strange because, of course, everybody knows it's it's just common sense that economics is this, you know, complex world of algebra and, <laughs> and crazy equations. And it's hard because the math is hard. Um, that wasn't the way the profession worked up until Keynes's day. Um, there, there were people who were trying to, to formalize it with equations, um, but the type of person who became an economist in the 1920s or the 1930s or the 1870s or the 1880s was really more of a philosopher or, or a poet. It was somebody who was, economics wasn't even a discipline at Cambridge um, when Keynes arrived on campus. I mean, he studied math at, <laughs> at Cambridge. Right. He was not, he, does not a he didn't get his degree in, in economics. Um, and his friends were all, were all philosophers, people like Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein, these, these big figures from uh, the analytic philosophy tradition. And you were sort of, you know, you were somebody who would be considered more of a misfit weirdo intellectual today if you were an economist, rather than someone who was, you know, on the fast track to a, a big job at a bank or uh, you know, a, a position of power in government. The economics profession today, I think, is very uncomfortable with the idea that it is uh, a, a value-laden, morally charged enterprise. The whole point of economics for a lot of economists, I think I would argue most economists who are certainly working in the macro space, is to provide a value-neutral sort of justification for policies, regardless of your views about uh, whether it's abortion or war or whatever it is. Um, here are the numbers, here are the facts. We can provide you with this value-neutral data um, that will give you the right answer. And I think Keynes would have found that, I, I know Keynes would have found that extremely, extremely troubling. He looked at economics as something that was that was inherently tied up in a in a vision of a good society, in a vision of a just world order, and to try to extract the moral content and the value judgments out of it um, was not only a fool's errand, it was very dangerous. It could lead to decisions that would make the world more likely uh, to come into the types of conflicts that we saw in his lifetime. 
Right. And right now, as we speak, you said basically what you just said on the Ezra Klein podcast, and a lot of people in the economics profession are upset with you. And, and I find exactly the same thing. I mean, I've seen many of them attack me, you know, oh, you fool, you have such an emotional understanding of economics. And one of the things that I actually took away from your book and loved was Keynes had a very emotional understanding of economics because he viewed it as intrinsic to the British-led world order, to himself, his understanding about how to shape a just society. And ultimately, economy in the exchange of goods and services, and you know, thinking of it just that way, and not of how we conduct commerce is who we are, is, is a view that just seems so lost to contemporary you know, political discourse. So bringing it back... We see this now, you said, you know, in the, and you see it somewhat in the Democratic Party, somewhat, you know, this podcast, friends of the show like Orrin Cass and a few others. But let's not kid ourselves and say that this is by, by any means the dominant mode of thinking throughout both political systems. But to me, Zach, it is the dominant way of which ordinary voters actually think about the economy. So could you reflect on that dynamic a little bit? Yeah, I think politically we're in a really strange place right now. I, I, the... There seems to be a break between, a, or at least a gulf, uh, between the way that our political leaders in both parties conceive of the way society should be ordered and, and repaired. I mean, I think, I think there is an agreement that society is, is <laughs> not in good shape right now. Um, and, and the way that ordinary people think that society should be, um, should be repaired. I mean, you can see this in, the, the simple version of this is the polling data on, on things like, um, what we traditionally call social issues versus economic issues. You know, I think among, uh, you know, the, the Joe Biden kind of Kamala Harris um, wing of the party, to, to be a moderate or to be a, a centrist is to be someone who broadly accepts, you know, 1990s kind of ideas about economics. You, you want to have low deficits, but, but you know, don't forget, about, uh, don't forget about the poor. It's okay to have some, some welfare spending in there. Um, but for the most part, you want to let the economy do its own thing. Don't intervene too much. The market knows best. Um, but on, on these social issues like abortion, and immigration, and the like, um, to, to hold like very progressive views. And, uh, and when you look at the public, including the Democratic Party itself, the, the numbers are really pretty much reversed there. And you know, I say this as somebody who's committed to the progressive side on all of these things, I, I, I don't want to throw out any of these, these issues. But, uh, but you know, the, the fact is, is like the public is just not where um, the Democratic Party leadership is, or even where the, the, the progressive activist left is, on things like abortion and immigration right now. Um, there is a consensus, I think, within the Democratic Party that Donald Trump's immigration policies are terrible and inhumane, but there is not a consensus about what the party should do um, among ordinary people. Now, that's just sort of you know, the, the, the polling angle. I think in terms of the worldview, in terms of like what you want out of public policy, a lot of what ordinary people want is, is, is to not have to think about public policy, right? Yes. They, want, they want to live a life where they feel supported by their family and their communities. And there isn't a whole lot of just, you know, noisy bullshit fighting happening around them all the time, right? Um, I think for the political class, uh, not, not just people at, at, you know, who, who actually wield power like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, but, but people like us who talk about politics sure. for a living, um, I think that uh, that kind of there's something exciting about talking about how the world ought to be ordered and and debating it and uh, and and having those questions be live. We don't have families and communities centered in our our worldview. We have these sort of professional goals and professional interests and cliques and and fights that are just not relevant to ordinary people as as centered uh, in in our our sense of self-worth. So I, I, I worry not only that, you know, I think, look, I, I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to be the next um, president. I, I, I just have a hard time seeing how Trump gets through the next three months with the country on fire uh, and the world on fire as well. But uh, I, I do worry that that disconnect is going to be something that makes it very difficult for them to govern in the next year. And that makes it difficult for the party, the Democratic Party, at least, to make sense of itself. I, I don't know the Republican Party as well as you guys do. I don't study it as closely. But I, I, think, I think there's a sense within the Democratic Party, that because Biden won such a crushing victory, that, ev- that all Democrats really love him and love all of the ideas <laughs> that um, all of the, you know, the detailed policy positions and everything about his record that, um, that, that people 
in the Democratic Party establishment who love Joe Biden, love him for. And I don't think that's the case. Um, I think I also don't think it's the case that they love all of the details that, you know, professional lefties like myself uh, <laughs> would right. go around detailing and saying, at least you'll admit it. Yeah. yeah. Can I, let me, let me make, let me sort of make the, cause we've actually picked up a decent number of neoliberal center left followers. So let me make the sort of case for their perspective, which is that everything I'm hearing on this episode from your sort of side, for example, the fact that we had all these issues with medical supplies, the fact that we didn't order our relationship with China properly, the fact that there were sort of these policy-centric mistakes, it seems to me the answer is just a chastened form of neoliberalism, a version of neoliberalism that says, hey, let's actually enforce the WTO, the WTO rules that we actually have to actually utilize. And that it's possible for the neoliberals to say, yeah, we didn't do a good job during the Bush and during the Obama years, but it's not as if we have to overthrow the previous world order. You know, if we look at what happened since World War II, we still have great power peace. Um, this is the most peaceful time in human history. This is the very basic sort of case. But I'm just curious, what do you think about that dynamic, which says, listen, Zach, you're bringing up good points, but that doesn't require us to throw, you know, everything out. It just requires us to be a little more responsible and maybe a little less ideological. No one going to sort of say the history is over after the Biden victory. No one's going to make that unless someone is very, very stupid. But I would challenge them to do so. Somebody uh, will. But we, <laughs> For the record, I think they're dumb enough. And they're invited yeah. on this show. Anyone who does that, please come on the show. We will be amazing. But yeah, Zach, what is your response to that dynamic? Uh, look, it's not a crazy perspective, which is why it hasn't been totally vanquished. Um, I, I think I think there are people who have been cautioning that we need to uh, do a better job enforcing these treaties um, for a long time. But I, I, I disagree with them in that uh, I think the meaning of those treaties is inherently tied up in one particular relationship, which is the relationship between the United States and China. What the, D, what the WTO means, what the fine print and the, the footnotes on any of these agreements mean if the US and China have a different relationship is totally different. The purpose of WTO is largely to get China into a trading relationship with uh, what we typically called the Western world before, uh, before you know, the WTO treaties were signed. That project has, I just think, been a straightforward failure. Um, if you look at the goals of the project that were stated at the time during the 1990s, uh, the goal was not just to increase GDP. Um, the goal was to create political reform in China and to eradicate poverty around the world, serious global poverty. And it's been 30-ish years uh, and it has not happened. Um, Neither of those goals have happened. There's a really devastating report that just came out from the UN Special Rapporteur on poverty, international poverty and, and severe deprivation, where he says, you know, we're not close to eradicating global poverty. We're not on the path to eradicating it. Most of the sort of uh, triumphalism that uh, defenders of globalization have had about the eradication of global poverty um, is the result of just bad metrics, of relying on statistics that don't make a lot of sense. So if you look at the number of people living on less than a dollar a day or less than two dollars a day, um, that's that's really, you know, there's been great progress. Bill hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. If you look at the number of people living on less than two dollars and fifty cents a day or less than five dollars and fifty cents a day, um, which he argues are more reasonable arguments about what constitutes severe deprivation, um, then we haven't made any progress. And so there's still wow. a billion people living living in, in under those conditions. So just tweak the numbers a little bit and all of this progress that we're supposed to be getting from this system doesn't seem to exist. And you know, Tyler Cowen wrote this piece a, a couple of weeks ago for Bloomberg, which I thought was really, um, really very illuminating. I, I don't wanna beat him up too hard because I think he was being honest in a way that other people have not been honest about this project where he said, look, slavery, outright forced labor is very common in the current global economy. And if we ask American corporations to look into their supply chains, to investigate them and find out where slavery is, we're gonna have a really big problem because prices are gonna go up and people who don't have a lot of money in the United States are gonna feel a very significant pinch to their incomes and to their standard of living. So what Cowan was basically pointing out was that things are so bad right now that inequality is so bad in the United States that we need terrible things like slavery and the rest of the world in order to support uh, the standard of living that we have in the United States state. That is a very grim view about globalization and, and what it has done. And that's about the big picture project. That's not, that's not a, a, a critique around 
specific sectors, things in the WTO treaties like you know prescription drug benefits, where uh, you know the, the international the, the intellectual property standards on prescription drugs create these just completely unaffordable monopolies that the rest of the, the, we can't afford in the United States, but the rest of the world, the developing world, can't afford either. Um, th those those types of of, uh, of provisions have been obviously bad on their face for a long time um, and people don't even really try to defend them anymore but I, I have a hard time seeing how you you have China remaining to be a, an authoritarian threat um, to its own people uh, for the foreseeable future um, no real change in the government there uh, that I that I think we can call positive over the last 25 years um, and no real change on global poverty so why, what, what is the benefit that we have from globalization other than the fact that it just is an existing set of norms that creates some sort of order and some sort of stability. There, there is a sense of fair play around those existing, uh, existing standards. But if, if it's falling apart anyway, that, that sense of fairness, uh, it, I think will, will disappear as well. Quick thing well, before then I we- don't wanna, I don't, oh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, quick thing before we follow up on populism, we keep, dancing around the China issue, especially from the progressive left's perspective. Because I think if you look at the discourse on China, I think it's the area where the progressive left has the most trouble. Because in many ways, you know, you've said it yourself, China does represent an authoritarian threat on several different levels. You don't have to be a rabid, hawkish, red baiter on the right to think that. But on the other hand, articulating the case against China forces you to defend much of the American-led order after World War II. Um, and it sort of forces you to stop debating what happened in Jakarta or Vietnam in 1965, which there's plenty to dunk on there. Obviously, I'm not diminishing those issues, but it also and also forces you to sort of move on to a certain degree from 2003 in Iraq, which I think all three of us from Sagar in my fifth grade <laughs> position very vigorously yeah, right. opposed. But moving forward, I think the left just struggles to think about China because they're still just think caught in these past debates. So how do you think about how, how do you see, sort of see that debate playing out? I think that's right. I think um, broadly right, but with, with a few caveats. You know, one of the reasons that I think globalization was people forget this um, because now the left is is sort of generally critical of of globalization. And I mean, I mean, people who call themselves the left on Twitter and distinguish themselves from liberals on Twitter. Um, I mean, like you know, pe people who do not fit in with the mainstream of the Democratic Party. That, that's what I mean by left there. There were people on the left who were very excited about the globalization project of the 1990s because the idea of creating sort of a new international consensus and bringing people together across international norms, they thought might be a way to sort of defang some of the U.S. imperialism that uh, that was so violent and so destructive over the second half of the 20th century. Um, I think the left in general has viewed is more comfortable talking about authoritarianism in the United States than it is talking about authoritarianism abroad. And and look, there's a lot of authoritarianism in the United States. I mean, in U.S. history, I think you can call Jim Crow an authoritarian order. I think you can call you know much of what happened in the Cold War uh, uh, acts of authoritarian or, or at least imperial aggression um, that that killed millions of people. So I mean, there's there's plenty to critique there. Um, and so when you when you then go and say, well, other countries that are major powers have problems, too, it's just I, I don't think there are people on the left who. Well, there are all kinds of people on the left, so I shouldn't say that. Uh, yeah, don't do the economist thing. Again. Yeah, You're yeah. getting in trouble yeah. for this. <laughs> not all economists are crazy and not all lefties are wrong. Um, I, I think uh, I think there are most people on the left when they stop and think for a minute about what happens in China, the fact that there's you know, a million Uyghur Muslims in detention camps. Um, that 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 gives the boss. <laughs> they're, they're, they're smart <laughs> enough to recognize this is something I'm not comfortable with. This is not a good alternative to what we have in the United States, even if what we want in the United States to be reformed. Um, that that takes a minute, though. It takes a minute to get to that point, to think about what's happening in China and what it represents, because the sort of default, the, the area that, they're, they're, that the left is just most, I, I think, um, attuned to, because it's studied it very closely, are, are the, the sort of uh, atrocities and and you know smaller faults with uh, with American hegemony. Um, so I do think the left can get can get real on China, but I also think the 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 president's policies on China make it tempting for people outside of the you know the I don't fit in with the Democratic Party left um, to to think about to, to think clearly about China because I, you know I I think. 
Trump's China policy has been a total mess. I agree with I agree with the you know the the, the normie Dems on on this point, but I don't think that the answer is to go around and saying you know oh we should uh, we should make sure Microsoft acquires TikTok right like yeah, I, yeah. I I don't yeah. think that's that's a good solution. But I think there is this sort of knee jerk response that if if Trump likes something, Trump does something, then the opposite of that must be good. Um, and that type of knee-jerk thinking happens because there's a vacuum at the top of the party about what to do about China. You still have people who are saying, no, 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 things are fine. Um, look, they don't manipulate their currency anymore, um, which is a complicated and loaded statement. Um, it, it, it's getting better. You still have some of those people, but for the most part, you have a lot of people going like, oh, what do we do? Like, I don't know what to do. And that allows, a, a, because there's no sort of clear leadership from the top, the rest of the party and even the left, which sort of creates its um, its views often in in it, to to be to criticize those of the the established the establishment in the party. Um, people just don't have concrete uh, sort of categories to to rely on yet. Zach, one of the interesting things that you just said, which. I mean, you were talking about it's it's about a cognizance there of you have to make a mental jump towards like, OK, like authoritarianism here in the U.S. could be bad, but also like it is empirically worse in China. The other thing, though, that I, I see is a uncomfort with the idea of sovereignty and nationality itself, it, if that makes sense, which is that just the very like recognition of American like nationalism and of needing a stronger nation state to then lead other nation states in a strong and possibly even compelling way is very uncomfortable to a lot of the progressive left that I deal with. And I see this a lot, you know, on Rising where people are like, I agree, you know, China is bad, but I have got this baked in assumption that like America is bad too. And that like anytime America does anything that were to lead another country, that that would be bad. So bringing this also, let's bring Keynes into the conversation because he was a supporter, as you point out, of kind of like the British world order and as a method of peace. So is there something for the left to learn, both in Keynes, um, in Keynes' view of the British-led world order vis-a-vis -vis how we should approach China right now? I think both Keynes and also in, um, it, Keynes and also FDR, um, there's, there's quite a bit to think on. You know, I think the concept of nationalism is a re was a really thorny one for Keynes himself, um, which may be confusing for people, but he was both a, a British imperialist and someone who was uncomfortable with the idea of nationalism at the same time. And that's because his understanding of British imperialism was that it was a way to bring peace, prosperity, and democracy around the world. It was, I think, a very rose-colored and naive view of, of the realities of, uh, of, of British imperialism. Um, but that's, that's what he believed. And he would get very angry and be very, very frustrated with, with his country when it would not live up, when it did not live up to, to these ideals that he had for it. And eventually in, with World War I, he came to believe that this, this portrait was, was completely false. Um, and so he spent the rest of his life trying to make it true, trying to create a world order in which the British Empire did serve as this sort of beacon for truth and justice. Um, and he failed to sort of restore Britain as a superpower on the world stage as it had been in the 19th century, but he did significantly reform uh, British life and, and I think reinvigorate a sense of national purpose in Britain. And he did that not only, uh, not through military, I think, uh, <laughs> exercises abroad, although of course, World War II, I think is a really important, I mean, these big wars do create obviously intense feelings of nationalism when they're, when they're taking place. Um, but, but through a set of social programs that he, that he pushed forward uh, during, during and after the war. Um, people forget that Keynes is the guy who socialized British medicine. Um, his, his most important policy legacy in the UK is not debt and deficits and, and helping economies get out of recessions. It's, it's nationalizing the healthcare system. He was the financial architect of the National Health Service and of the British welfare state. He believed that if you didn't have some way to make people feel like they were protected from the swings of fortune, whether it was war or depression, that there wouldn't be a sort of nation to hold together. And you would have, you'd have uh, conflict and this, this sort of social splintering and you know, not, not just war, but also enmity between, between neighbors. I mean, people just not getting along in the streets. Uh, and he thought that was bad. <laughs> he thought that was a really bad thing. He, so, and, and this, 
this sort of conception of social harmony and, and national purpose is something that he followed into, into things like art. I mean, he wanted to build, he did in fact build theaters all over Britain after the war so that local artists and musicians and playwrights, this is the era before television, could, could just go out and perform and have audiences and feel like they were part of, of a, a shared social and cultural project, that they, they weren't sort of divorced from whatever was happening in, you know, London wasn't the only place where, where great cultural things might happen in Britain. So I think that concept is, is, is one that shouldn't be frightening to people on the left. And I, I certainly think that FDR uh, and, and the various projects that he um, pursued under the New Deal were projects that were aimed at creating that sort of shared sense of national purpose during during the depression of, of having people feel like they could rely on each other um, rather than than <laughs> have to take from each other in order in order to survive. Um, but as a, as as foreign policy goes, you know, the Iraq War was extremely damaging for people. I think from our generation for uh, images of uh, America as this. You know, end of history, good guy hegemon, and I think for for the baby boom generation, I think Vietnam was extremely damaging to that, and it's it's just it's hard for people um, to see to see past that. Um, and look, there there's a reason why it's hard to see past that stuff. It was really bad, <laughs> and we're still you know we still have a refugee crisis in right. in Syria that is uh, you know a long uh, a long tail from the the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But it's also the case that in many places all over the world, even considering the, the horrors of the Cold War and, uh, and the invasion of Iraq, there are places that want more American leadership. There are places that, that say, we would like to ally with the Americans to do something good so that something bad does not happen. And that is, a feel, that, that, is, that is where diplomacy comes from. There is no avoiding the fact that you have to do diplomacy when you are a rich and powerful nation as the United States is. And, to pretend that uh, that just renouncing imperialism and and standing back and and criticizing uh, America's role in the world is is a solution, I think is a little bit is a little bit naive. There are things that the United States has to do, whether it likes to or not, just because of its position in the world. What those things are, I, I think the left needs. Uh, I think the left needs a foreign policy. We we haven't had one. The Obama foreign policy was just like don't screw up like Bush did. You know, we, we he literally said, "Don't do stupid yeah, the, stuff." Right? Literally, he literally, don't do stupid shit. Yeah, that, that's what it was. And he still did a lot of stupid shit, right? Like, uh, I mean, this is the thing. <laughs> he droned a wedding. Okay, I mean, he had he had a he had a helicopter attack on a Doctors Without Borders hospital. I mean, that stuff. Nobody actually likes this stuff, right? Um, but that it happened because there wasn't a real sense of of what America's role ought to be. The left and even the center left hadn't grappled with with what it ought to be. And I I I think until this is this is sort of getting back to your question about about Biden and and the establishment and and how secure it is in its in its foundations given what a crushing victory Biden Biden won. We have to admit it was a crushing victory over the Sanders and Warren wing of the party. I don't think there's a real consensus on anything about what the United States ought to be doing in the world right now in the Democratic Party. That's the perfect pivot to the more domestic side of this conversation about populism. So let's go back to February 2020. You know, I'm sure you guys have heard sort of the phrase that Gettysburg was sort of the high water mark of the Confederacy. I think we could say that and I'm not saying populism is the equivalent of the Confederate States <laughs> of America, but careful, careful, I'm being very careful here, but clearly February, February 6th or something like that Nevada. was Nevada, Nevada was the high water mark. Nevada was the high water yeah. mark of populism of the left and the right, because on the left, you have Bernie dominate in the primaries. And then on the right, President Trump's doing really well. You have the economy going well. Everything was sort of Trump. And I think I suggest any viewers go back and watch Crystal and Sagar during that specific oh, two it month times, period. Man. It Backflips. was like, going on the show. It yeah. was just wild. It was rabid. The dunks were great, <laughs> but that all went away. So what sort of, what is sort of, and this started before coronavirus too, right? So Zach, what happened as your reporter side? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, Look, this was a tough period for me too. It's not just you and Crystal Sager. Uh, I think I wrote a piece after after Sanders won Nevada that was like, "It's a great day for American democracy." <laughs> and, 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 and President like, Obama made some calls, and that was yeah, a little like, different. Obama made those calls, you know? and, <laughs> but you know, I think that that. Let me start with what didn't happen, uh, and then I'll try to get to what what I think did happen. 
um, I'm still I'm still working this out. So I I I, um, I hesitate to give a definitive answer. But with with that caveat, um, you know, I don't think President Obama making a bunch of calls and getting a whole bunch of people to endorse Joe Biden mattered that much. Um, mm-hmm. There's 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 sort of one wing of the the Sanders, uh, you know, the, the Bernie wing of the party, that, which says, you know, if Elizabeth Warren had just endorsed Bernie, <laughs> it would have stopped it all. And, and like no. black voters in South Carolina would have risen up after Mayor Pete's endorsement of <laughs> Bernie right. yeah, or Warren or whatever. Like, I, I just I don't think any of those endorsements mattered. I don't think most people in the party were sitting around waiting to see like, oh, oh, well, Amy Klobuchar endorsed like. No, they, they don't follow the primary this that closely the way like professional political people do. Um, look, people like Joe Biden. He is, look, he's a pretty charming guy. I think we have to like acknowledge that. Um, you know, he creeps out a lot of people on in, in progressive circles, but I think for most people, he's kind of an affable, goofy old man and, uh, you know, a, a good grandpa or something. And he was in the Obama administration. And most people in the Democratic Party remember the Obama administration very fondly. Um, I do not necessarily share those memories. I think there are a lot of things the Obama administration um, did not handle very well at all. Uh, I think at, at best it's a complicated presidency, um, but but that's not the way Democrats see it. I mean, Democrats see it as you know that those were the good old days, and every well, that's not that's not the way Democratic voters see it. I think that's the key point, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Right. It's not just. It's not like the establishment is like tricking them with with uh, you know with bad media and it's MSNBC. And if they, if they only had, you know, more Bernie supporters on MSNBC, then people would know the truth. No, people, people are informed. They're reasonably informed. They know what they like and what they like is the democratic party from, uh, you know, from the Obama years. Could it be better? Yeah, sure. But really the bad guys are the Republicans. It's not people within the democratic party who do things wrong. And I think I I hesitate to talk about polarization and, uh, and, you know, the, the way, the country is 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 divided and, and, and all that because I think often that is a sort of political sciencey way of dodging yeah, issues right. that people actually do care about in ways that in which the country actually is closer together than uh, than it, it seems in Washington. But I do think, particularly in primaries, you know, Democrats are the good guy in the Democratic primary and Republicans are the bad guys, and it it's it's asking a lot of Democratic voters to say we have to throw out. Um, the Obama legacy because uh, it because it didn't work. Um, now, my own view is that the Obama system didn't work. I mean, we ended up with President Trump. I don't see how you can look at the world today and say that was a really great way to do policy making. And I think you can do that without thinking that President Obama is like a venal, terrible person, right? You could, he was just like mm-hmm. wrong about what was going to happen um, and well-meaning. I, I, I have a much, I myself have a much like sort of rosier view of Obama than I do of, of someone like Bill Clinton. Um, Quick. Quick, quick thing, because this actually Sagar and I always have this debate. And after I ask this, I want you to jump in, Sagar, because this is actually a really important idea. I'm not quite sure how much Trump's election was a repudiation of President Obama. And this gets to a deeper issue in the Democratic Party, because because the real test case here, if, if President Obama was able to run for a third term, I think he would have handedly beat Trump. So I think it was really just a repudiation of Hillary Clinton in a poorly run sort of late stage Democratic Party campaign. So I, I think there's I think there's something sort of important there for whether or not we could ever go back to what 2015 looked like. I, I, I certainly agree with you that if um, that if Obama had run against Trump, he would have beaten him. I, I mean, the. It, it's you have to be careful reading too much into any election that's decided by 77,000 votes as the 2016 election was. I mean, people on the left have been fighting about whether it was race or class or globalization or what, you know, or Hillary Clinton. I mean, it's all these things. There's 77,000 votes. Um, so, yes, I agree. You can't you can't see Trump as a as a total repudiation of the Obama years. But I think a a better managed presidency would not have left his party so vulnerable um, to an authoritarian takeover. And look, there are. Uh, there are re- there are reasons to to distinguish between Trump and the sort of strongman rhetoric he uses, and the types of authoritarianism that we are seeing in places like Brazil and uh, and, and in Europe that are, that are rising up. But there is clearly a kinship here between between Trump and dictators that he that he does not shy away from. Um, and I think the fact that that became popular in the Republican Party is in part a backlash to Obama, but also in part because the country a lot a significant part of the country was not in fact taken care of during the Obama years. The recovery was very slow. Um, 
you can't blame all of that on Obama, but but you can blame quite a bit of it on on the administration and its response to the crash. Uh, and and look, you can the, the Wall Street Journal did this this just I think fascinating piece of reporting back in 2016 saying look at the counties that Trump won in the primaries. They are all counties that were hit very very hard by the China shock. So hollowing out American manufacturing, you know, it may not have have shifted people from Republican to Democrat, but it changed the composition of the Republican Party quite a bit, I think. Uh, and certainly then in, in the Democratic Party, you know, Trump going out there and talking about trade. I mean, I think that mattered a lot in the upper Midwest. Um, I think I think what happened with the opioid epidemic, I think not only did it uh, make a lot of voters not enthusiastic about going out and voting for a Democrat, I think it made a lot of voters dead so they couldn't go out and vote for a Democrat. Um, so I, look, I, I think if the Obama project had been the, the right way to respond to the Bush years, I don't think you would have President Trump at the end of it. You may have a Republican president at the end of it, but I don't think, you know, I think we might be looking at Jeb Bush instead of, instead of Donald Trump today. Yeah, it's such an important point. And apologies if there's any background noise. My washing machine is fixed. They're trying to fix it right now. To all the realignment uh, listeners at home. My answer to this is just like you have to disaggregate what we do here is disaggregate Trumpism from Trump himself, as in Trump is a uniquely chaotic figure. And Trumpism is the idea of there's a realignment happening in the Republican Party, the redefinition of conservatism. You got to disaggregate Obamaism from Obama himself. And that's why you look at Hillary Clinton. Hillary is a uniquely like odious aggregation, like distillation of Obamaism, but it's still Obamaism, right? And then you could call that neoliberalism. You can call it kind of like whatever you want. Whereas the way that I look at it is that why you can read a little bit. It's like he was talking about with that Wall Street Journal piece, which is if you can read and be like, well, look, like counties that were hit by the China shock voted for Trump and Sanders in the primary. Like, that, that is a repudiation, like you said, of Obama. And one of the things, too, that I would like to point to, there's a fascinating bit of reporting, actually, that just came out about 2012. And it was that in the beginning of the 12 campaign, Obama had so much trouble getting it through his head that the rosy vision of the country, which he was trying to paint on the campaign trail, was not the reality in Ohio and the rest of the Midwest. That the ultimate victory of the Obama campaign, pointing Mitt Romney out as a plutocrat who would, you know, destroy the country and all this, that was ultimately still kind of an underdog message. It was a message of, I recognize you're still hurting. But in the beginning of that campaign, kind of when Obama's polls were down, and why I think if Romney had actually run a very different campaign, kind of a Trumpist campaign, I think he very much could have won. Because in 2012, they were feeling it, Zach. They were feeling exactly that kind of economic fallout that you're talking about here. And with a bitter critique of kind of his bailouts, I think absolutely um, there could have been some repercussions there. So that's kind of my answer on the whole Obama front, you know, Obama and Trump front. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Remember how, how, how just vicious the, uh, the Obama ads were against, against Romney. And I, I mean that in a, a positive way. I, I thought they were terrific ads. I wanted Great President ads. Obama, I Great wanted ads. Obama to win in 2012. Yeah. I was glad that he did, but, um, but I mean, these were, they, they were attacking him for, you know, Cayman Islands, offshore tax havens, Swiss <laughs> bank accounts. I mean, this yeah. was, this was like full bore populism that you were getting from the Obama ads and you did not get the same full bore populism from Obama governing policies. Um, right. And and so I think, you know, Obama's a re really good politician. I mean, I think he's uniquely charismatic in ways that um, I, you know, I don't know if I've seen a politician with that kind of uh, likability in my lifetime. I, I know that's a loaded phrase for after the, the, uh -oh. the Hillary Clinton campaign, yeah. but yeah. like, but but look, uh -oh. people, pe people love Barack Obama. He's cool. Yeah. He's, he's nice like, guy. he's funny. Like whenever he would do the- uh, They like Michelle too. So this isn't do. just yeah. a gender thing. Michelle. Right. right, they do, and well, and they're they're both cool. But like the, you know, when they would do the uh, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, it was always a terrible gig for whoever the comedian was who was supposed to be funny, because the president was always funnier, and it was always unexpected that the president was going to be funnier than the comedian, because his job is not to be funny; his job is to be boring and and stale. And so I think people were able. Certainly, I feel this way about myself in two thousand eight. People were able to identify with him and see themselves in him in ways that uh, that allow him to appeal to a very, very broad audience of people who don't necessarily, you know, commit themselves to his specific, you know, agenda in Syria or in uh, or, or right. in China.
So we're um, nearing our last section. So there are two main things I want to hit. Um, second of which is sort of like the future of the right. So Sagar, you take that. What I'll ask you though is you said something really interesting. I think it was on Joe Weisenthal's uh, podcast where you said, looking at 2008, the response to the 2008 financial crisis on the left was Occupy Wall Street. And then what you then see that coalesce, that, that sort of pitters out obviously, but you then see that recoalesce around Bernie and the progressive left moving forward of AOC. And then on the right, you sort of see the sort of weird Tea Party response that then sort of reconstitutes itself as the Trump um, campaign and the presidency. So sitting right now, something I always just think about is that like right now, there's someone sitting in their basement and they're just really pissed off about something, right? Their, their unemployment's about to fall off and they're probably going to do something, something political. And we haven't heard their name yet, but they're going to sort of matter. So what do you think looking out 10 years in the future how would you predict we're going to sort of see this populism stuff manifest itself? Because I know that your next book is focused on the topic of populism. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, near term, that person is going to vote against every incumbent they can. I mean, they're mm -hmm. going to vote against President Trump. They're going to vote against their congressperson. They're going to vote against their senator. Um, long term, whether that that frustration uh, is channeled into an organized political party, I think is very much um, is is very much a, a sort of to be determined issue. Uh, the Democratic Party does not seem interested in harnessing that that energy beyond November. Um, it doesn't. I, I see uh, Biden picking Kamala Harris as a very clear indication that Biden is is happy with his sort of faction of the Democratic Party being in control, and he doesn't feel like he needs to reach out to other factions or fend off any any sort of of, of surge from from the sort of populist. Uh, left or, or populist right. Um, he, he thinks he's fine and, and they'll be able to govern uh, essentially without these folks. And I think if you look at the way that Nancy Pelosi manages the House, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi's first priority isn't to make sure she has the best coronavirus bill she's got. Her first priority is to make sure that Rashida Tlaib and AOC don't get any wins in the package. Right. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear. After that, we can worry about what, what the bill actually looks like. And she hasn't had too much trouble doing both of those at the same time. Um, she, she, she's been able to, to, to sort of make the progressive left shut up. And I think for the, uh, the Biden presidency, certainly the early years putting together you know, the, the fiscal package, I'm sure there's gonna be a giant fiscal package that they, they try to do right out of the gate. The hope for something genuinely transformative is that there's some sort of, you know, august centrist international body that puts out a bunch of white papers saying the United States needs to do a lot of really transformative stuff. And then, then, you know, Michael Bennett will pick it up and say, like, look, Joe, you know, we got to change our relationship with China. Uh, and Joe will be like, oh, good idea. Um, Brookings not, said so. Right, exactly. Yeah. It, it, if, if it's, if it's, if it has the stink of the squad on it in some way, they'll, they'll run screaming from it and say, no, 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 we can't do that. They're, they're the bad right. faction. Um, uh, so, like, I mean, and that I think is extremely dangerous because it's it leads in November. I, I just don't think Democrats have a choice. The, the reason Biden can can name someone like Harris, um, who has you know been at odds with <laughs> different kinds of activists on the left for most of her career um, and get away with it, is that, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to vote for Trump? Like, no. <laughs> and and I think yeah. if you're a Democrat like me, um, you see Trump as a existential threat to American democracy, and so you, you have to vote for the for the for the Trump ticket. I mean, for the Biden ticket. And uh, and you know, voting for a for a third party or for uh, casting some sort of protest vote um, is I, I just don't think it's a uh, it, it's it's really on the table for folks right now. Um, but that you know the the coronavirus is not going to be solved on election day or inauguration day. We are going to be living with this for years and years and years. And there's going to be all kinds of social dysfunction that results from it that we cannot even predict. And people will start organizing other types of political movements. We may not even recognize them as political at first. Um, the way that communities are gonna to have to be, are gonna be forced to respond to stuff because the federal government is not going to respond in an effective way. Um, you know, there will be, grassroots things happening, not all of them good, um, just as there have been in previous er eras of instability. And uh, I, the reason I want to write a book on populism is because I think these eras are, are, are incredibly difficult to predict. The 1880s and 1890s 
I certainly don't think you would have expected at, uh, at the collapse of Reconstruction in, in 1877 to have a major movement led largely by proud sons of the Confederacy calling for multiracial democracy in the South. Um, okay. and, I, and I certainly don't think once you had that happen, you would have pre expected it to completely collapse and turn into like a weird sort of cult of anti-Semitism. So uh, things are going to happen in American politics that are going to be very, very different from what we've experienced since the 1990s. We've had a very stable era in a lot of ways. And, and I think if I were to defend neoliberalism, that's what I would say about it. I would say, look, things have been pretty stable. Don't you like that? Isn't that good enough? Um, <laughs> and, and I think we're, we are headed for an era of, of upheaval. Yeah. Well, if anybody out there is a three body problem uh, fan, I when the moment you said stable era, I was like chaotic era. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think is it's on right the on the bookshelf line. there, so it's yeah. good. good. And there, I, I gotta say, Zach, this is a good segue to the right. I feel, I, you know, I should feel optimism. I said this on the last podcast, which is look, like you said, the Democratic Party, they've made their choice, right? At, at least for the next four four years. Biden, Harris, John Kasich is going to speak at the Democratic National Convention longer than AOC, right? Uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Joe Biden has explicitly said, I want this party to be a bridge to people like Pete Buttigieg. It seems like a double down, a triple down, an explicit choice. I want to be the neoliberal party. But what you're talking about right there, which is that on the right, uh, the way I see it, this is happening is Joe Biden is going to come in, like you said, they'll do some, you know, the, whatever the Heroes Act is, for Nancy Pelosi with Chuck Schumer. And the right is just going to transform into deficit hawks. Their their ultimate thesis of the case is going to be, no, God, we got to win back all these upper middle class right, white rich people to our party and become this party of deficit hawkery, even though they find us like totally socially reprehensible. We'll try and uh, we'll try and get them to come and vote for us. So neither party infrastructure seems to have any interest in what I think is this massive you know, voting block out there that is yearning in order to be harnessed into some potent political movement. And you wrote a little bit, you know, we really appreciate shouting out this podcast um, in, in your piece. And there's a little like mention this the podcast. So we, oh, okay. we, that's well, a fuck you we have to okay, pick but, that bone with him. I, I, met, okay. I mentioned uh, both of you guys by name. Okay. I thought that was, uh, I thought that was nice <laughs> enough. But like, look, I, I mean, you know, people look to me, new right, populist right, you know, I consider myself, you know, at least one voice for a tiny part of that. But let's be honest, I mean, most of the populist right is bullshit. Um, it's just as, uh, it's just as ineffective as the squad has been in terms of getting anything into, you know, major l legislation, except for the Paycheck Protection Program with Marco Rubio, which we talked about here. So, I mean, neither party is harnessing this energy out there. And, you know, you're immersed in the history of populism. Could you think about it from a rightist frame? How might it materialize? Because do you see the scenario I laid out as clearly as I do about the return to deficit hawkery? And then can it be vanquished again? I mean, I honestly don't know. The the return to deficit hawkery is really fascinating because it's, you know, I don't know if it was always so transparently just bullshit. Um but it was for the this is the no yeah. this is this is this is i say well no no that we're, before you jump back in zach i think this is the most transparent it's been it's never been telegraphed this clearly you've never seen a literal day where five editorials are sent out by three different writers and then four different hill speeches are given yeah i i mean <laughs> one of the things that i mean look i the, the kane's book to give away the ending he, he dies two-thirds of the way through and and the, the final third of the book is sort of a Keynesian history of what happens to to Keynesian ideas and yeah. how how they are sort of how, how Keynes becomes sort of an instrument of American power um, is, is a posthumous kind of kind of uh, figure to legitimize what the United States government is doing. And, and what you see from that is that, you know, absent the Clinton administration, you always have governments spending big. It's the question and running up big deficits. The question is what they spend on. Um, Mm -hmm. The idea that there is some sort of, you know, Republicans are against deficits and Democrats are, are, are for them is not, it's just not true in terms of, of how, how these parties govern. Um, I, I don't think I was as aware of that before I started the project as I am now. And I don't think I was that aware of it during the Bush administration, even when George W. Bush was, you know, I think Joe, Joe Stiglitz wrote a book called The $3 Trillion War, um, which is a good critique of the economics of, of, of that war. But it's, it's also kind of funny, like 
that the problem with the war in Iraq is that it costs $3 trillion. Yeah, right. Dollars, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not thousands of Americans dead, but yeah, 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 yeah. Right. $3 trillion bucks, fuck. Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on your podcast. Um, swear all you want. Okay. Uh, I said covering my butt earlier. That sounds terrible. Yeah. Covering my ass is what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, so uh, your point, though, about thinking about uh, this age of this coming age of upheaval as uh, from, from a rightist perspective is one that I have, I, I sort of have trouble with these words like left and right in that context, because I think, sure. I think what, um, what we're talking about when we talk about people who feel like they're not part of the political system, that they're not, that their, their lives and their beliefs and their, um, what matters to them is not represented in, in Washington. Um, I think that that is not just people who are, you hear this from conservatives a lot, right? You, you hear like evangelical conservatives saying like, you know, Christianity is under, is under threat. People like us are, are not, you know, Christianity could die in a generation. You know, we're, we're, we're isolated. We need somebody to, to, you know, to defend our interests. Um, we don't see ourselves in these parties. I mean, that, that happens, but you know, just the, I, there's a great piece from the Times that was written right after 2016 about uh, a barber shop in Milwaukee, and and there's just, I remember this. I remember this. this. Yeah. Terrific piece. Um, just about just about black voters being like, yeah, I didn't vote. I mean, Clinton sucks. Trump sucks. What's the big deal? Like, let's let's do like normal things that people care about here. <laughs> you guys want to talk about sports? Um, that is a symptom of of a democracy that is under duress. You know, we talk about low voter turnout. And I think Democrats quite rightly criticize Republicans for voter suppression efforts. Um, voter suppression has been part of the Republican playbook for a long time. But in a lot of ways, Democrats suppress their own votes um, by just not governing in a way that makes people feel animated about what the party does. And so when it wins elections, it interprets this as, you know, the we, we, we were better than the, the Republican Party. I mean, I think Obama ran a great campaign in 2008, right? But I also think mm -hmm. that like, you know, your your washing machine that is broken right now, Sagar, could have beaten yeah. George W. Bush in 2008. I mean, we, yeah. had, we were in the middle of a complete financial meltdown. We'd had a catastrophic war in Iraq. Uh, every single project that, that the Bush administration had put its name Trina. to. Trina. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, Katrina. it was, yeah. was disastrous, right? Uh, That's a really bad end of a presidency. It's it's sort of like, you, you sort of like <laughs> forget, like, man, that was bad. Like, yeah. not trying to make light of it, but that was bad. Like, oh, yeah, and that's really bad. Just a side note, it drives me nuts seeing these people being like, oh, W is so good now because he's like painting this bullshit book about immigrants. I'm like, guys, the country was so bad in 2008. <laughs> it was horrible. No, it was, it was in really bad shape. Uh, and, and this was sort of like, you know, peak neoliberalism too, right? Like, uh, you know, this was the golden age that, we're, that, that we, we all want to return to um, after the horrors of Trump. And I, I think... Um, I think it, did, it doesn't take a genius to beat that guy, right? And the fact that you did beat him doesn't mean that everybody loves everything that you that you brought to the table. Uh, although, you know, I I certainly did love what Obama's bringing to the table in 2008. I thought that was I, I was disappointed by his presidency because I had these these unrealistic hopes for um, for what for what he would do. But the the fact is that most of the country feels dis, dis, has felt disconnected from politics for a long time, which is part of the reason why we have some of the worst voter turnout in, in the developed world. Um, and that, you don't have to be a, you know, you don't have to be a historian of populism to know that if half the country is never showing up for elections, there's a huge, there's a huge block of the country that's ready to be mobilized to do something politically um, that isn't happening in American politics. So I, I, I do think that there, there is kind of a sleeping giant out there, um, but I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to wake it. Uh, I, I thought the Sanders campaign and the Warren campaigns were doing a really great job of it in, in the Democratic primary. And then I was wrong. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think my closing thought here, um, and then we'll get y'all's closing thoughts, is just that the Democratic, and if there's, I think my main takeaway from the 2020 primary is the Democrats with the coalition they have, moderate to upper middle class, suburbanites, urban voters and then like persons of people of color like that's a great coalition you don't, you don't have to embrace that sleeping giant you actually have that's a that's not a coalition that i think wins congressional elections right so you're gonna have bad midterms most likely but that's a great coalition to win 
national elections, right? That's 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 a great national. Ele- You're going to win it every four years. It's sort of how Republicans after. Um, LBJ dominated presidential elections, but didn't do well in congressional elections. I think under the status quo, that's what we're going to sort of have happen. Um, but if you're a Republican, though, I'm thinking to your point, Sagar, about sort of the deficit hawkery. It's like, good luck winning back former country club Republicans when you're sending QAnon supporters to Congress, right? Exactly. So like, yeah, like right. good no, no, luck, no, exactly. good yeah, luck. Right. Going. I, I'm from, I'm from, I'm from, you know, uh, Lake Oswego, Oregon. It's upper middle class town. It's literally the exact place that a generation ago was Reagan country, was very much like we go to the country club and then we love our low taxes. Good luck moving there and then saying, <laughs> oh no, like, yeah, there's this QAnon person who's also a 9-11 conspiracy yeah. theorist, yeah. but also, like, your taxes will be marginally lower, and, like, we're it's not like, going to, no. like, spend yeah. money. It's insane. <laughs> no, I mean, look at look at Virginia. I mean, I, I, I grew up in Virginia, so I'm very familiar with the politics there, living there right now, and, uh, you know, Virginia is is this the state that's gone blue, not because, you know, all, all of the coal miners in the western part of the state unionized and started making demands of the government in Richmond. It went blue because you got a lot of professionals in Northern Virginia decide they didn't really like the, the sort of social policies of, of the yeah. Republican Party. And, uh, and, and but, but who did Republicans nominate for Senate in 2018? They nominated Corey Stewart, who yeah. is a neo-Confederate. And if you look at where the, where the votes came from for, for Corey Stewart in the primary to get him over to the top, Corey Stewart won because Northern Virginia, the place where all of the, you know, fancy like liberals like me live, uh, the Northern Virginia Republicans wanted Corey Stewart to be their, their candidate. So the, the idea that they're, that, uh, that the suburban, uh, the, the suburban vote is just waiting to go to Corey Stewart and, and QAnon, I think is, is totally ludicrous. And I don't see, it's not just in congressional districts. I mean, that's a statewide race and, and, and a winnable statewide race. I mean, Mark Warner, survived by the skin of his teeth in 2014. Um, and, and Republicans just totally threw it away on a, on a lunatic candidate. Yeah, and this, and this is my like closing thought too, which is that you, you guys are both exactly right. And that, I know we are. And, and the key <laughs> is, <it. laughs> is that, look, Marshall, that's the key insight. You can be a Democrat and continue to win under the status quo. Under a Republican, look, Trump didn't win the popular vote, people. Like you lost by 3 million votes, right? Like. If you want, if you want to win, if you this is subject to our last episode. If you ever want to win a national popular vote election ever again, you have to dramatically change the coalition. And so these these losers want to go right back to 2012. But Zach, maybe you can expand on this just a little bit. You know, last thought here. I have come to the ultimate conclusion that these people don't want power. They're much more comfortable in the Senate minority and in the presidential minority because they can raise a shitload of money sending grandma's uh mailers about Benghazi and they can get rich. So you you can you can keep your Senate seat in Kentucky, keep your Senate seat in Mississippi, launch your bullshit investigation about Benghazi or whatever, you know, the tax thing, IRS, etc. Obama phone. It's crazy. Her- <laughs> yeah, Obama phones, right? Obama phones. Heritage yeah. Foundation making tons of money, right? I mean, oh, oh my god, MAGA grandmas are going nuts. They're sending in $5 <laughs> checks. Um, into the things, texting or calling or, you know, Rush Limbaugh's getting rich, Sean Hannity radio, uh, uh, things are better than ever. But they don't want to win because it, the, the economic incentive of it is actually to keep losing and being a loser party. So, you know, last thought on that, if you have any thoughts. This is obviously something I care a lot about. Well, you know, uh, with the caveat that I don't want to uh, speak for all Republicans, uh, I mean, <laughs> look, look, at, um, look at the career of somebody like Mike Huckabee. You know, right. th- this guy used to be uh, a, a, a governor who actually did things right. Like he had mm-hmm. policies that were not all of them, even from a progressive perspective, terrible. Um, he took governing seriously. I think by most accounts, he was one of the better governors in, that Arkansas has had over the last you know, 50 years or so. Not a disaster. Serious person. Um, he is now just like a total like lunatic clown who makes a gazillion dollars um, selling idiot books to conspiracy theorists. Um, yeah. That's his, that's what he does with, that's what he did with his, his career and his platform. So there is this, this intense uh, grifter strain in, in Republican politics um, that particularly uses the presidential um, uh, race and as, as a sort of way into um, this, this field of, you know, <laughs> making a lot of money on specialty conservative book publishers. Uh, but you know, I, I kind of can't really believe 
that people in the Heritage Foundation don't actually want to win and have power in some way. I, I, I look at, um, I look at somebody like Stephen Miller and see what he's doing on immigration policy and and say, you know, I think the Heritage Foundation feels like uh, like like they got they got a lot of stuff done that they're getting some wins here. Um, well, see, that's that's interesting because, I mean, Miller is not beloved by the Heritage Foundation, believe me. And most of the Heritage Foundation probably does not you know, agree with him on immigration. I, I, I don't want to speak also for the Heritage Foundation. There are a lot of good people there. We've had heritage people here on the podcast and they're good. All those caveats, et cetera. More, more what I was saying is, is that. There's this, it's like you said, this direct, like, grifting instinct that seems to be so predominant. And, and Marshall, you weigh on this too. It, it seems more predominant on the right. It just does. Like, empirically. And, and yeah. I don't know why. You know? So, what's interesting, so the, I think the yeah. best, aside from the monetary advantages of being associated with rising is, um, and getting a lot of rising viewers on this podcast, is I think we've gotten a lot of interaction with left, with left, left people. Yeah. And... Yeah. I genuinely feel as if on the and I think this is like a philosophical thing. I think the, the the whole idea that conservatism and the Republican Party is about limited government and restraining things, I think leads you to prioritize certain things. But if you're on the left, you're sort of driven by, hey, I want to have Medicare for all. I want to do this. Yeah. I want to do that. And that doesn't mean that those policies are necessarily correct or not, right? Like, you know, I don't agree with Medicare for all. But I just think there's a – if you are on the left – and you're sort of in this activist policy space, you are driven towards governance and like whether or not like the actual policy is serious, an attempt at seriousness that doesn't exist on the right. So for example, like you could not do if let's say AOC became just like a total like AOC could not do what Mike Huckabee did. Right. So AOC mm -hmm. could not have a terrible third place finish in a, in a, in the, let's say the 20, let's say, because Huckabee, well, in 2008, he got, he did well in Iowa, but then he flamed he out after Iowa. that. Right. Yeah. He won Iowa, then flamed out. AOC could not win a first state, flame out after that, get a show on MSNBC that is basically just like schlock write yeah. terrible books that are designed to sort of like make a left audience happy and then just sort of keep do that wouldn't be a career for her i think she yeah. very quickly would be sort of replaced and the audience would get bored of her so i don't I know the structural thing yeah <laughs> i just remembered his book title god guns grits and gravy all right great, great, no no, no yeah. gridiron it was grit wasn't it gridiron gridiron it's like, gridiron. It's like <laughs> come on man I, you know marshall i think you're you're on to something there but i i would also i would caution you though that you know on on the left there there, activists do get involved around certain policies and policy fights. So that, that is true. Um, but also to be on the left, and by the left here, I mean people who are critical of the mainstream of the Democratic Party, sure. you have to see yourself as an underdog. You have to be fighting a David and Goliath fight all the time. And so in order for, for you to like maintain your self-conception of yourself as somebody who uh, is this kind of fighter who's taking on the system, you can never actually fully become the system. You can never actually win. Because mm -hmm. if you become the champion, that if you become Goliath, then, uh, then, you're, then you're not on the left anymore. So I, I, I do think there, is some, there, there are some limits in the activism space um, for, and, and some barriers there for actually you know, ex exerting real power. Because you want, if, you, if you get there, you, you sort of lose your, your identity as, as, uh, as, as what you are. But, that that is that is a problem for the you know the, the far left activist space not <laughs> for people who run for office like AOC who i i know she seems like this terrible frightening radical to people who watch like you know CNN but like AOC is not that far to the left if you talk to people who are professional leftists right i mean there are like actual anarchists out there <laughs> <laughs> great point all right we think we should end on that note that was a fun little uh side note so zach thanks so much for joining the podcast man great conversation and can't recommend the book enough i've got it right here behind me fantastic i have the physical book i've got the audio book recommend you guys all get it as well so thanks zach appreciate it thanks so much thanks, for having me guys